Good evening, and welcome to the Marlington Local School District Board of Education meeting of Wednesday, April 26, 2023. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Invocation, Evan Dennison. Dear Lord, I pray that we have uh, a good meeting tonight. Uh, I pray that you give wisdom to our board members as they discuss our future, and you provide everyone with a safe ride home. We thank you for getting everyone here. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Roll call, please. Josh Hagan. Here. Kieran Humphreys. Here. Kathy Krupko. Here. Mark Ryan. Here. Jonathan Swift. Here. Nice Miner. Here. Thank you. Reading of the mission statement, Mr. Hagan. In collaboration with staff, community, parents, and students, the Marlington Local School District will develop lifelong learners who understand and apply knowledge and demonstrate excellence in pursuing the highest standards with effective intervention to challenge every student. Thank you. Are there additions or corrections to the meeting agenda? Yes, sir. Uh, there is one um, addition, a correction. Uh, recommend the motion to approve the following preferred substitute for the school year. Verification pending satisfactory credentials, BCI, FBI checks as required, Janice Luke. That would be added to the agenda. Okay, added to the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. So. Yes. Mr. Ryan. Yes. Special presentation. Okay, so here we are at the uh, special presentations. Uh, so we're going to start with our uh, April Students of the Month. So we're gonna have Mr. Farrell from the high school come on up and present the uh, High School Elks Students of the Month. Good evening. Um, I have the honor of recognizing two of our finest students here from the high school tonight. Our first Elks Student of the Month is Emma Jackson. Emma, could you come forward, please? <laughs> Emma's the daughter of Chip and Melanie Jackson. She's an executive member of Character Counts Club, a member of Student Council, and secretary of Rotary Interact Club. Emma is a captain and four-year letter winner on the varsity softball team and former goalie on the varsity soccer team. She is a Duke Crew leader, member of National Honor Society, and Spanish National Honor Society. Following graduation, Emma has committed to continue her academic and softball careers at West Virginia Wesleyan College and pursue a degree in computer science. Emma's <laughs> teachers say she's a fantastic student and exceptional leader in the building. She's often seen helping out around the building in various capacities, whether that is tutoring students or working as an office aide. She's volunteered her time helping underclassmen, particularly in science, and her efforts have been applauded by staff, students, and parents. She's the type of student who works well with everyone and makes everyone around her better. Her experiences serve her well in the years to come as she takes on even bigger leadership roles. Emma, it's my pleasure to recognize you as an Elks Teen of the Month. Congratulations. Our other Elks Teen of the Month at the high school is Evan Dennison. Evan, come forward, please. Evan is the son of Christopher and Rebecca Dennison. He is a member of the Marching Dukes of Marlington, Concert Band, Marlington Chorale, and Drama Dukes. Evan is a member of the National Honor Society, Spanish Honor Society, 
the treasurer of the robotics club, and a member of the chess club. Evan spends his free time acting with the Carnation City players. He enjoys math, science, musical theater, playing the clarinet, and singing. Following graduation, Evan plans to continue his acting career in college while pursuing degrees in chemistry and music. Evan's teachers say he is a very mature, responsible, and polite young man. He is an exceptional student who always goes above and beyond what is required. He's often seen around the school participating in various activities or clubs and making those a better experience for all involved. He always has a smile on his face and his positive energy and attitude is contagious to everyone around him. Everyone, Evan has a bright future and is very deserving of this recognition. Evan, congratulations on being named an Elks Teen of the Month. Next up, middle school principal, Mr. Rizzoletti. Middle school would like to recognize two students in the month. And first up, we have Michael Foss. Michael is the son of Margaret and Robert Foss. His teachers have this to say about him. Michael's an extremely hard worker who goes above and beyond to expand his knowledge. His quiet kindness is appreciated by all those around him. Michael is a respectful young man. He's always on task and does his work very thoughtfully. He's a quiet leader and works well with whoever he's partnered with in the classroom. Michael's one of the hardest workers we've ever had in class. He even volunteers at the Alliance Community Pantry, where he gives back to his community. We're very proud of Michael Foss. And next up, we have Bryn Reese. Bryn is the daughter of Jennifer and Chad Reese. Here's what her teachers have to say about her. Bryn is a determined, hardworking young lady. She knows what she wants and how to get there. She's willing to help others and set an example to fellow classmates. Bryn has a smile that's infectious. If she's smiling, you know others around her will be too. Bryn's a very thoughtful young lady who always works hard and takes great pride in doing great work. Bryn's a very dedicated student who works hard every day, not just for the grade, but to truly understand the material. She's generous and kind, tries her best no matter how challenging something may be. And Bryn displays a never give up attitude. This will carry her well through all her future endeavors. We're very proud of Bryn Reese. Next up is Mrs. Weber, Lexington Elementary. Good evening. Um, I don't believe that our Kiwanis Student of the Month is here today, Miss Page Re or Miss Page Reed. No. So we're going to talk a little bit about Paige. Um, she is our Kiwanis Fifth Grade Student of the Month at Lexington, and her teachers selected her because she's an exceptional student. She works hard on her classwork, always pays attention in class, and will help any of the other students in our class if they're struggling on an assignment. She is incredibly considerate of others, uh, which I believe, that was written by, this is written by Mrs. Kellums, is one of the reasons her peers have elected her to be student council representative this year. Staff members can count on her when they need a respectful, responsible student help, to help out. Paige also has a fun sense of humor, a bright smile, and she adds positivity to the classroom every day. A couple things about Paige, if you wanted to know, her favorite subject is science, and what she has to say about her family, especially her pets, is that she has a very tiny dog, um, and then she also one day would like to be a person who helps animals in some form. Uh, in some form. One thing she'd like us to know about herself is that she's very flexible, 
and she loves to go on walks in her free time. Paige Reed. Next up, Mrs. Mort, Marlboro Elementary. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Marlboro Elementary's April Quantus Student of the Month, Quinn Dale. So a little bit about Quinn from his teachers. Quinn is new to Marlboro Elementary this year and has made a great name for himself in fifth grade. He is likable, kind, and humble. Prior to the school year, Quinn was in a homeschool setting, and we are so glad that he is at Marlboro Elementary this year. He is a focused learner who works hard in and out of the classroom and has been a wonderful addition to our fifth grade class. Quinn was chosen for this honor due to his ability to adapt to new situations and thrive in an unfamiliar environment. We were happy to welcome Quinn this past fall, and we are thrilled to have him in class with us as we grow together in education and friendship. Quinn, we are immensely proud of your growth this year and wish your continued success. It's from your teachers, buddy. Good job. A little more about Quinn. His favorite subject in school is social studies because he thinks history is really cool and Mrs. Beatles makes it fun. Some other special things about Quinn's family. Mom and dad are Heather and Rick, and his 17-year-old brother is Gabe, and they're in the back. Next up, Mr. Spondeel from Washington Elementary. Good evening, everybody. I am honored tonight to introduce our Kiwana Student of the Month at Washington, Piper Shenansky. Okay. Piper, her teacher said about her, is a kind person who works hard in school. She's a great friend and an even better student. Piper strives to do well in all areas of school. She is smart, funny, and kind to everyone. She has a wonderful personality, and you can see Piper smiling at all times during the school day. She is willing to help the other students in her class, and we are certain she will be successful in middle school and far beyond because of all these traits and many, many more. Her favorite subject in school is art and science. She lives at home with her mom, her dad, her sister, and her brother. She also has a dog and a cat, and she enjoys going on family vacations with everybody. After school, she hopes to be a veterinarian, and one day she would enjoy visiting Paris, France. Pepper really enjoys hanging out with all of her friends and running, and one of her special talents is she is an excellent artist, and she's especially good at drawing. And I've seen her art in person, and it is really, really good. So we hope she continues that hobby as she gets older. Congratulations, Piper. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, before we do, uh, dismiss uh, the students, the parents and the students of the month, so congratulations to them. We have one more special presentation tonight. So if I could have uh, Mr. Bilko, please step up here. So I'm gonna, before I hand it over to Mr. Miller, let him talk a few minutes about Mr. Coe. I'm just going to do a big, uh, Mr. Coe retired as an educator in Marlington from Marlington Local Schools. He was 40 years as an educator. 36 of those years was with Marlington. Matter of fact, I think he retired when I was middle school principal. Uh, Bill retired. I, I give you the best story about Bill is, you know, I, I, as a principal, you have to evaluate a teacher. All right? So you go in there and you sit down at the teacher's desk and you watch them teach a lesson. They present it in front. 
Bill's got like a, I, I recall it's like what you see on a refrigerator for like a grocery list, like a little slip of paper. He's got it stuck there on his, on his desk. All reasons I may retire, you know, because at this point he's, you know, pushing 40 years. And it's email, email, internet, email. <laughs> You know, the list, the list was all tech, tech reasons. So it's, uh, I had to get a giggle when I was going, when I was going through this. But uh, he has not stopped. He is, he, I think he is at 10 years as an Alliance School Board member currently and still an Alliance School Board member, um, actively involved in Marlington, actively involved in Alliance in many different aspects. Uh, I brought him here tonight uh, because he's also worked for the last 35 years as our migrant custodian. So he works all summer as our custodian for our migrant program, which in itself is just absolutely amazing. So that was the reason why, you know, I asked him to come tonight, but it's not the real reason why we asked him to come tonight. So I'm gonna ask Mr. Miller to step up and speak a few words for Mr. Coe. <laughs> Mr. Coe started our softball program from scratch with a couple bats and a couple softballs so they told me i wasn't here at that time third in the state of ohio and we've enjoyed winning seasons for a long long time during his 26 year career he ran one of the best programs in the state of ohio winning 365 games 11 sectional titles seven mbc titles league titles three district titles and of course We've seen the signs uh, that have been up for a long, long time, one state title. But Bill, we're not here because of just the wins. We are here because everybody in here that came for a visit knows the man of Bill Coe. He did it the right way. And I don't think we would be here celebrating all the wins if he hadn't done it the right way. He didn't recruit. He took the, the township girls that came to him molded them, gave them passion, gave them an understanding of the game, made them better players and, of course, better people, and won a lot of games along the way. He abided by all the rules set forth by the Ohio High School Athletic Association. Some coaches have a hard time with that, but he abided by the rules and still won anyway. Bill, you gave passion, a love of the game, and a desire to get better, and you instilled that in our girls, and as I said, it lives on to this day. Most of all, Bill, I can say this because I remember coaching and being with you uh, before you retired. You loved your girls, and they loved you. On behalf of the Mar Marlington Athletic Department, and speaking for the thousands of former Duke softball players, I am honored to request from the Board of Education that from here on our varsity softball field be known as Bill Coe Field. Thank you very much, Board of Education. I know you had to vote on this, so thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Swisher, I, I don't know about you. I got this letter in the mail to come to this so we could celebrate uh, service for the migrant program. And as I was sitting here, I see my family come in. and lots of friends in the background. So I knew you didn't come to celebrate me sweeping the floors and dumping the trash <laughs> for the migrant program. So this is a very humbling, hum, humbling uh, award, I'll tell you. Uh, we received a lot of awards over the years and it was nothing I had to do with it a whole lot. I had excellent, excellent coaches. Uh, in fact, uh, Sean Dillon and Ken Zupanik were with me both for over 20 years and that's, that's unheard of. Uh, with assistance. You know, Chris Middleton was with us, uh, Steph Koblenz, who is in, the, in one of the schools now, she was with us for a few years too. But uh, the, the number of girls that we had, uh, I, I once I had a, a conversation, I had a chance to meet Woody Hayes, and uh, he had his troubles, but he, he told me one time, you win with people. And boy, did we have the people. We had, I don't know how many girls that were uh, all, all, all league, all section, all district, uh, we had three or four of them were all state. They went on to uh, play in college, and some of the records that they set are still 
uh, with Ohio High School Athletic Association. So we had a lot of, a lot of good players. Then I had a chance to meet um, uh, Jim Tressel. He was a good friend of Dale Herbert's who's sitting in the back there. And uh, I had a chance to talk to him, and he said, surround yourself with good people, and, and you'll have success. And, and I did with the assistance I had. Dale helped us out sometime. Mark Young, who was uh, on the staff here still, did some weight training with the girls' exercise science. And, uh, of course, uh, the first year that I was hired, uh, Mayor Andriani was superintendent. He hired me. So I'll uh, put some of the blame on him. But uh, it was a great experience. Uh, the girls, we had a lot of fun. I had never had any discipline whatsoever, uh, problems with the girls. And we had fun. We traveled different places, and we had uh, a tremendous a lot of fun. They did a lot of fun things to me, too, which, which uh, some of them I can't discuss here. But uh, I'll give you one good story, and then, then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, we're, we're up in Cleveland. We played a doubleheader against Central Catholic uh, uh, High School. And uh, after the game was over, I asked the girls, do you want to stop at McDonald's? And, of course, they all said yes. So we were all eating there, and uh, a couple of girls went to the restroom. Well, they didn't come out, and, and I'm still sitting there. A couple more went in. And I'm s still sitting, about four more went in. Next thing I know, the whole team's in the restroom. So I'm thinking, uh-oh, some, somebody fell. Some, something's wrong. So they called me. Coach Coe, come, come into this restroom. And I said, well, what's the matter? You get, he said, you got to see this. you got to see this. <laughs> so I walked into the restroom, and they're all, there's, there's stalls there, and there were five of them on this side of the toilet bowl and five on this side. The others were standing in the other uh, stalls looking over the top. And I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? And they said, watch this. And one of the girls sat down on the toilet and stood up, and, and the seat rotated real fast. And I said, what, what's wrong with it? And they said, well, it's, it's some new, new piece of equipment that is installed in women's restrooms so you can sit down, and when you stand up, it cleans itself. So we're standing in there, so they said, sit down. So I sat on this thing, I stood up, it spun around, and uh, next thing I know, the manager came in. She said, what's going on here? What's going on here? I said, well, well these girls, have never, we're from some place, and, and we haven't seen anything like this. So she said, where are you from? And I said, well, we're from Carrollton, Ohio. Because <laughs> I didn't want to say we're from Elias. It looked like a bunch of hillbillies in, in the restroom. So that's just one of the stories, but I have a whole, whole, whole bunch more. But this is indeed an honor in, in uh, again, board education, uh, athletic director, uh, staff of Marlington. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have an official dedication. This sign will go under our scoreboard on the softball field. Uh, the guys are on it tomorrow. They tell me that they'll get that up for us ASAP. And then Tuesday, May 2nd, if you'd like to write this down, before our varsity plays Salem, uh, we'll have a, an official dedication. We'll get Mr. Coe out to throw out the first pitch, and we'll start that at 445. The game starts at 5. Yeah, I'm going to do it right now. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Coe wanted to make sure everybody can leave now so they don't have to sit through the board meeting. Because <laughs> if you, anything you don't know about Mr. Coe, and I, and I talked about his teaching and his work ethic and as it continues, he arrived to work before anybody got to the middle school. He worked in the seventh grade. He would open every single door for every single teacher every single day he was there. So, and he never called in sick. So it was like, Maybe in a rare opportunity, he was not there. The teachers freaked out because they came to work and their doors were locked. They didn't have keys. And that was just how he is. Uh, on that note, I did tell him over here that, you know, because he's an Alliance School Board member, he actually has a meeting that night. But the Alliance School Board has graciously adjusted their time schedule for May 2nd, you know, so we can get the dedication to the field in before you do your official duties. You're welcome. Other than that, we are going to move on to the formal part of the board meeting. So this would be the time for you to uh, exit if you choose. <laughs> Thank you for coming out tonight.
Yeah. Area. yeah. <laughs> I saw Okay, as we move on here to the formal part of the presentation, we're going to start with uh, our OSBA presentation with Mrs. Kathy Krupka. Okay, the OSBA has gotten very busy. Um, they have a lot of, of legislative reports to give out. Um, House Bill 47, uh, I'm going to try to skip through who sponsored it, in, um, is being discussed, which would require each school to place an um, automatic external defibrillator, an AED, in each building. Um, they're also proposing that each district and school be required to provide training to teachers, principals, administrative employees, coaches, athletic trainers, and any person who supervises interscholastic athletics. The districts would also be required to hold informational meetings about symptoms and warning signs of car sudden cardiac arrest for all ages of students before the start of any athletic season. Um, it also requires the district to adopt an emergency action plan for the use of AEDs. Uh, the Department of Health would be charged with creating a model plan for district use. The plan has to be practiced at least quarterly and it's currently pending in House Health Provider Services Committee. Um, House Bill 63 uh, is one that they're discussing that would require schools to provide age-appropriate classroom instruction on conflict resolution in grades K through 12. That bill is pending in the House Primary and Secondary Education Committee. House Bill 103 uh, would create social studies, sta uh, social studies standards task force um, that would consist of nine members, some appointed by various, uh, the governor, speaker of the House, and president of the Senate would each um, appoint individuals to that task force. And they would be charged with developing statewide academic standards and social studies for grades K through 12 and there's a lot of specifications that go with that. Um, <clears throat> it's not yet been referred to a committee in the House. Senate Bill 49 would require school boards to adopt a policy that accommodates the sincerely held religious beliefs of students as it relates to exams, other academic requirements, and absences for faith or religious belief. The policy will allow up to three religious expression days each year for students, and it must include a language that a student who is absent for a religious expression day is allowed to attend interscholastic events or other extracurricular activities on those days that they were absent. Uh, it also has to provide a procedure for students to notify the school of any grievance regarding implementation of the policy. Under this bill, the schools would be prohibited from imposing academic penalties because of student absence and schools would be prohibited from considering absences when determining absence hours that require parental notification. Uh, the bill specifies that students must be given alternative accommodations if they miss exams or other academic requirements. National Teacher Appreciation Week is May 8th through 12th. It was introduced to Congress by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1953. 
It is a time when schools around the country honor teachers for all they contribute to students' lives and to society as a whole. Uh, the OSBA Student Achievement Fair is seeking innovative programs. Um, so if our district has any innovative student programs, talented performing <coughs> groups, or amazing artists, we need to be sure to nominate them for the OSBA Capital Conference Student Achievement Fair. Deadline for performing groups to be nominated is May 17th. Um, and then there is a deadline of October 27th for um, presentations of artwork and programs. Josh, I believe you are the student achievement liaison for uh, the OSBA. So if there are teachers or administrators who have a particular group that they would like to see highlighted at the student achievement fair at the OSBA conference in November, please uh, see Josh about what that would entail. Um, the Ohio EPA is encouraging environmental excellence in education program and recognizing uh, K through 12 in public or private schools for their achievements in environmental stu stewardship and their efforts to educate students on environmental topics. The deadline for that is coming up April 30th. Ohio School Safety Center is accepting nominations through May 31st for the first Ohio School Safety Standout Awards, which will recognize two students and two staff members who have made significant contributions to school safety and security through their commitment, efforts, and leadership. Contest and nominations are open to K through 12 and higher education students and school staff. Uh, in 2023, we will be having a, an Ohio School Safety Summit, July 25th and 26th at the Columbus Convention Center. There are um, testimony opportunities coming up in the next week on um, the income tax cut that's being proposed, school funding, transportation, ed choice vouchers. Oh God, there's a third page. Uh, and multiple other things. So if you have any, um, there is, we have an OSBA website um, that will deal with all of that. Um, and they are encouraging administrators to read through what they're talking about and provide our input as required. Um, Let's see here. The House Higher Education Committee held a third hearing on House Bill 6, which would enact the Saved Women's Sports Act. The bill would require schools, state institutions of higher education, and private colleges to designate separate single sex teams and sports for each sex. So they're still discussing that. It has not come to a vote yet. The Senate Finance Committee held testimony on the executive budget proposal for fiscal years. 2024 and 2025. They have amended and passed Senate Bill 6, which was sponsored by our local Senator Kirk Schuring, which would prohibit the state teachers' retirement system and school employment retirement system, among others, from making investment decisions for the primary purpose of influencing environmental, social, and corporate governance policies. There was a group of us who attended the Northeast Ohio Regional Conference last month. Um, there were several excellent speakers, including one from Peoples and Wagner, a Mr. Kevin Locke who discussed levies. And if you want to give that to Bob, he can have my copy of whatever they discussed at that. And I also yesterday attended the April Forum for the OSBA. And there was a lot of discussion on how the OSBA um, BASO, which is the administrator's organization, the organization that collaborates all the ESCs, are all working together to provide um, collaborative work from all those organizations to benefit education in Ohio. That's it on that one. <laughs> they've, they've been busy. They're going to go on break soon. <laughs> Reports will get short. Any questions for Kathy from OSBA? All right, Kathy, we're going to stay with you. Um, do you have an OHSAA update? Okay. Um, I was recently named to a liaison committee between the OHSAA, the Ohio Athletic Association, and um, the OSBA. Uh, that meeting was, it was a two-hour meeting in Columbus last month, or I'm sorry, April 13th. Um, we got a chance to meet um, one of the executive directors who was absolutely phenomenal. Um, he discussed the fact that several years ago they were just about bankrupt and through some uh, conserving of cash and better management of funds, 
They now have a $12 million operating cash uh, surplus, and they have taken their have taken out of that $3 million to invest um, and support the mission of the OHSAA. Um, they did some restructuring, and um, for the first time ever, uh, required schools, especially during COVID, to pay a fee for participation, which was $100 per sport uh, per school. That has been reduced now that they've got a surplus going of $50 per sport per school. Um, they are now operating in the black. They're staying on budget. Um, we discussed um, where they actually gain their money. One of the concerns that um, Steve and I had talked about before I went to the meeting was that at certain levels when we send our kids to state competition, which we're incredibly happy for them and proud to do, we don't get any reimbursement back from the OHSAA. So it, it is a little bit of a financial burden to the school. Um, however, they informed us that really they make their money on the early events. Um, the early rounds of any state tournament, basketball, football, that you're hosting, the, what, that we can make money hosting those events, that's really where the um, OHSAA makes most of their money outside of the school fees. Um, towards the end, when you get into the final rounds, not many people attend. Um, not a lot of schools will let coaches and teachers and students out to go and support those events. So there isn't a lot of income from ticket prices, and yet they still have to pay venues and, and all of that stuff. Um, they're not allowed to share in the profits from any of those events, which is why they've set up this $3 million fund, and they are hoping this year the plan is for them to give $1,200 back to each school, each participating school which Steve tells me will bring us, will help cover all of those expenses. Um, it's gonna go on a year by year basis. They hope if funds keep going as well as they've been going, maybe next year it's 2000, maybe each year that amount will increase. So that's their plan. We also discussed the environment, um, the air, uh, where athletic events are taking a place. They, we have lost a lot of officials. Um, and some of it that they're telling us is because of the environment at the schools that they're officiating at. Unruly crowds, unruly parents, unruly coaches. Um, as they went through all of the things that they're recommending that schools do to prevent a bad environment, I was really proud to sit there and think, we're already doing all of those things. Our faculty man managers know what they're supposed to do. We have athletic directors and administrators at every single event that handle situations before they ever get out of hand. Um, I was at a recent basketball game and watched Mr. Miller come up into the stands and remove a couple of students who were sitting in the middle of the parent section creating issues. So we're staying on top of it. Our kids are respectful. Our administrators are doing a fantastic job our ticket sales, our faculty managers, all of that. We are on top of all of the recommendations that they're, they've put out there. So kudos to our athletic department and all of our um, administrators. Uh, they are trying to address the, the issue of officiating shortages. Um, out, and I, uh, Steve said that he's aware of it. There are some companies that they are working with um, and I talked to both Steve and, and Dan about this, that will help us include officiating classes in career tech. Um, officials can start as young as age 14, but if you have ever seen a 14-year-old referee or a, a umpire a baseball game when you've got angry parents, it's pretty overwhelming. So they're willing to come in and mentor and do a lot of stuff to help us get a surplus so that as, as these kids get older and, and our adults, they're officiating at a better level. Um, um, you have to be, I believe it's 18, to officiate an, a varsity event. So one of the suggestions they had is if you've canceled a game because of weather, now you've got a varsity game and a freshman game at the same time, you can use younger officials for the freshman game and pull the, the older individuals for um, to officiate at the varsity game. So it gives us a little more flexibility. Um, mental health care for coaches, staff, and student athletes is a big focus. They're wor working on a collaborative program with The Ohio State University to um, 
facilitate that. Um, AEDs was one of their big topics uh, and making sure that everybody knows where they are, how to use them, and when to use them. Um, we were told that um, one of the issues that um, is being discussed is what to do with the gambling profits. Not the, not the lottery stuff, but now that we can go and bet places. I don't know anything about that, but they're looking at how to spend the gambling profits. And one of the House bills actually suggested that some of it go to athletics and some of it go into other educational pieces and certain percentages. So there's a lot of discussion going on about that, but the Secretary of State is, is adamant that he would like to eliminate pay to play and they're discussing how, what's that, what that is going to look like because not every school in the state of Ohio does pay to play. So they're trying to figure out how to equitably deliver that money as it's needed. Um, they've changed some summer contact dates. They are looking currently at division alignments. It's reviewed every two, two years. They have sent out messages to ADs and also coaches reminding them to get that information, to get the EMIS information in, because once you are set in a division, that's it. There's, there's no getting out of it. So if, if by error, because somebody didn't look at the numbers right, a small school gets placed in division one, they're stuck there for two years. There's not even a way to pay a penalty to get out of it. Um, they're asking all coaches or all schools to please stay on top of reviewing academic requirements. The biggest black hole that they've found that, that students keep falling into is um, when they're taking college courses. And when they choose to drop a college course, it's not always quickly, you're not always quickly notified and then suddenly you have a top student, a top athlete who is no longer eligible because they don't carry enough credits. So that was the gist of that meeting. It's a good meeting. It it's a good meeting, very good meeting. Both of them were. Okay. Do we have any uh, questions for Mrs. Krupko on OH, uh, sorry, OHSAA? I will tell you they are, they are very focused on making sure that school, school boards maintain local control over most situations. That's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good reports. Okay, we're going to start with uh, have Nash Miner come up and give his report. So our student board representative is going to give his report. I learned my lesson, Nash, so you should, I shouldn't <laughs> be anywhere near your report now. Good, good. Um, it seems like it's so much time has gone by since the last time I was here, and really a lot has been going on in the meantime. So I uh, try to just give a good little, like uh, you toss a pebble on a pond and you just hit, just skip over the water to get a little bit of everything of what's going on. <coughs> so on the academic side, we are currently in deep in Ohio State testing across all the buildings. Um, we have um, in the high school, every Tuesday and Wednesday getting the test done, but it seems to be going smoothly from what I'm told, so that's always good to hear, and everyone's been saying that it's been not too bad, so we're really getting close to the end now. Looking at extracurriculars, um, Character Counts has a blood drive coming up, so they've been getting people to sign up for that these uh, past two weeks and going to be getting uh, that to go. They've been really successful. The last one we did earlier in the fall was actually one of the most successful we've had here at School History, so we're hoping to surpass that and keep getting a lot of donations. The Spanish National Honor Society just had a paint night the other night uh, where they invi invited parents and students to come for a small fee to learn just how to paint a simple scene that was um, had a Spanish culture to it. It was really a fun night. I heard a lot of positive things with that, so hopefully we can do that again in the future. Horticulture has a spring sale coming up May 13th, so just keep an eye out for that. There's going to be a lot of really great um, flowers and arrangements come in, so that is going to be a huge sale that can help out our hort um, community. FFA has a fishing derby coming up. Um, they've been advertising a lot for this. Last year I heard it was pretty successful, so we're hoping to top that again this year. It'll be May 10th, and it'll be on the school property and the ponds behind the high school. On the art side of things, 
Uh, choir took a trip to Disney back in March where they got to perform and enjoy um, all of that Disney had to offer. They said it was a fantastic time and I really think a lot of them made some really cool memories that will stick with them for way past high school. Along with choir, band also went to Disney and they performed in the Magic Kingdom parade one morning and then they also got to enjoy um, all that Disney had to offer. So I saw a lot of pictures, a lot of posts on Instagram. Everyone had a great time. That was really a cool thing that we were able to do with a little bit of fundraising. So um, that was a huge success. They also have a concert coming up in May, May 16th. So that, that should be a good one since that'll wrap up the concert season. Um, there's also an art showcase going on right now at the Stark County High School Art Exhibition. It's at the Kent Museum of Art, and we have four students that are actually displaying art there. And here are just some pictures of their pieces, so they will be displayed now and for a little bit more time. It really is awesome to showcase all the talent we have here at Marlington at um, the county level and the Museum of Art, so that's a very big accomplishment on their part. Uh, in sports, we have the boys' tennis, which have been really uh, raking up a lot of wins this season, a lot of dual meets and invites that they're doing great. They're getting win after win. So it's a lot of great momentum that we hope to keep going as we are approaching the postseason. Tomorrow they play versus West Branch. And then this Friday they also have what is called the Net Tournament in Jackson Park. That is a massive tournament that many people from this area go to and compete. So that should be a really fun day for our tennis athletes. Softball just had a trip to Tennessee last month where they um, got to play at a tournament and have a little bit of fun along the way. Um, it went really well. They all had a ton of fun there, so that was a really cool experience that they could have down there and have some team bonding as well as getting um, being undefeated in the tournament down there and doing some really good things, so that was really fun to see. Baseball um, might have been off to a little bit of a slow start, but they're really starting to pick up uh, some traction now. They've been, I think, three wins in a row at this point in the season. So um, last night they had a huge win versus Salem, 14-4. to four. And so I think that with the momentum we have going now, we can really get some uh, good things, even though early on we, they might have seemed a little discouraged because of injuries. But now I think they're starting to figure out how to get the – vibe going so we can continue to win even if it's not under the ideal settings for us. Uh, the girls outdoor track has been competing weekly with dual meets and uh, most recently the county meet which was a very big performance on the girls side being the team runner up in the county for division two three. Uh, the boys outdoor track has also been competing in the past couple weeks. Um, as far as dual meets go with the league, they have been undefeated so far, and um, they'll play, uh, they'll run versus Alliance next Tuesday. They were the champions at the East Canton Invitational, and they were also the team Division Two, Three champions at the county meet, also placing, I believe, fifth in all divisions, which was a pretty good standing for um, some really big D1 teams. Uh, Colin Cernancy also took the county MVP in all divisions for his uh, really impressive performance where he was, he helped the 4x8 team go to a win. He won the 1600 meter run, setting a school record, a meet record, and a facility record. He won the 800 meter run, and then he came back and helped the team get fourth in the 4x4. So really outstanding performance by him. So, as always, uh, to keep up to date, follow our social media. We have a lot going on, and our tech department is really fantastic about staying on top of things as they happen. It kind of amazes me. I can be driving home from a meet sometime, and I get home on my phone, I see it's already posted the results before even I had time to call my family. So it's pretty, pretty impressive what they do. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nash. Yeah. Right, very nice update. Okay, we have a few more updates. Uh, I talked about this last month, so our next update is going to be a transportation update by our
Transportation Director, Mrs. Sickles. She's very excited right now. <laughs> okay, just a quick update from the Transportation Department. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have gone past the high school or been to sporting events the last couple of weeks, but if you've noticed buses maneuvering around the parking lot, we've been practicing for the uh, school bus rodeo that they have every year. Um, we've even had North Canton and Salem drivers come over and practice with us. So uh, we had six drivers participate in the East Regional School Bus Rodeo this past Saturday. And it was held down at Indian Creek School District, which is located down in Mingo Junction, which is just south of Steubenville. That was an interesting trip. <coughs> Excuse me. So we competed against seven different schools that were down there. Um, and I was proud to say that a team of four of our drivers won second place team with their combined scores. Last year, they won third place team. So the drivers were June Ramey, Debbie Weisel, Lynette Ronsky, and Alice McCartney. We also had a driver score second place overall, and our district also won the Spirit Award, second time in a row. We were quite spirited. <laughs> awesome. um, our staff is uh, interested in hosting uh, maybe our regional uh, rodeo being held here at Marlington next year. I need to discuss that with Mr. Swisher to see if he would approve that. <laughs> we did that back in 2018 and we had a really good outcome and a lot of people showed up to participate. <clears throat> um, on to other things, I wanted to stress the importance of being on a purchasing plan for our buses to replace at least one, if not two, buses occasionally each year. Four of our spare buses are 17 years old. Uh, we've had three of our regular bus route buses and two of our spares just quit and they all needed new engines, which is a very expensive repair. Uh, we decided to repair two of the newer ones and that cost is approximately anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to purchase that engine. And the mechanics are doing that work in-house, otherwise it would have been about thirty-five thousand to uh, ship that work out. Um, we didn't feel it was financially a good decision to put much money into our older buses, so we're not going to repair those. Uh, three of our buses that are assigned to routes already are already 12 years old. Um, you know, an aging fleet, I know we've bought several buses in the past years, thank heavens that we did, because um, I don't think we'd be able to function without the purchase of those new buses. Um, you know, our buses travel over 2,000 miles a day. You know, we are 91 square feet, covering over three townships. Um, fuel prices have skyrocketed. I'm sure everybody has, has hit their pockets this past year. Uh, September, it was 3.89 a gallon for us to purchase it through the, um, for the, through the consortium of the county. October, it went up to 4.25. November, it was up to 5.25. Uh, February it went back down to 349 and April this past we bought 7500 gallons and it was 291. The fluctuation of that is just really went into our budget for fuel this year. So the average cost so far this year was roughly about 389 a gallon. Last year we purchased um, 52,452 gallons. This year so far we've purchased 34 1,792. So I, I feel that we've conserved um, gallons, and I believe that's due to the newer buses. They do have a, um, a better fuel mileage. Um, and then on a lighter note, next Saturday, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, May 6th, we are hosting a, trans the transportation's gonna be hosting an open house job fair um, for new drivers. Um, we would like to, we're going to have that from 10 to 1. Uh, we'll be having different stations for the people to come and go through. People can come and meet the, some of the drivers. Uh, they can sit in the bus, possibly drive it around, depending if there's no cars in the parking lot. Or we'll take them for a ride. <laughs> um, they can get information, what all's involved in getting their CDL and their S&P endorsements. They can ask drivers questions. Uh, learn about the benefits. We can guide them in applying online. 
They can also apply to sub for other jobs like bus aid, cook, custodians, because we're very short on those subs also. Um, we'll have a food cart there. They can get something to eat and a snow cone. And we'll also have a basket for them to have a chance to win. Um, next week, the drivers are going to be handing out flyers to send home to, to the parents to see if maybe they might be interested um, or they know somebody that would be interested. And maybe we can get a few substitute drivers licensed and we can lead them into a contracted position. And we're going to have several regular drivers coming up for retirement age within the next year or two and we need good quality trained drivers to take their place. And this is our flyer. I know if anybody has noticed it's on Facebook and uh, so we're going to be passing these out to get the to get the word out. Any questions? Any questions for Sherry? Thank you. No. Thank, Thank you, you Sherry. Thank Excellent you. job. Thank you, okay, next up we have a technology update for uh, for this year with uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Siders. Good evening, everyone. Um, give you a quick uh, update of the tech department and what we have going on. Uh, first, I think Mr. Coe said it best. You got to surround yourself by great people. Um, up there is, all, is the tech team. Um, I have a privilege of working with all, all six of those individuals. Um, on the right-hand side, Ben, obviously in the back, uh, and then Max in front of him. That's his uh, right-hand man, does a lot of the break fix and, and maintaining the network with Ben. Uh, and then in the back in the middle, we have Erica, Luke, and Joder, which works at uh, Lexington. And then in front of her is Heidi Miller, which works at the middle school. Um, she serves as a, a tech assistant and a librarian, so she's dual rolled as well. Um, and then the left-hand side, John Myers, which works at Washington. And uh, Sylvia McElroy, which works at the high school. I um, want you to notice I did miss one building. So during the school year, we had our... Uh, TA at Marlboro, uh, he resigned and went to Alliance to work as the eSports. So we're working one tech down right now, uh, and I think we're doing a pretty good job of covering um, and covering for that, that building. So great group of people that, that we work with. Um, some of the things we've been doing, so we upgraded the internet speeds uh, with all the one-to-one -one devices this year. We went from 500 megs, we doubled it to go to a gig. Um, it's just with all the student traffic and it, it's all the, the stuff that's going on with society today. Um, we also set up and deployed over 1,800 student devices. Uh, so in the summertime, well, this, this time of year, we'll start collecting devices. Um, and, and Max and Ben work on them over the summertime, make sure they're ready to go for our teachers and students uh, come the school year next year. So we set about 1,800 of those up. This is a major one, MAPS. Uh, it's a big district initiative coming out of uh, the district leadership team. We want to make sure our kids are, are moving forward a year's growth and educational um, growth. We've done over 11,000 sessions of MAPS testing. We got another round coming, so that's gonna go up. So we're testing MAPS. Every kid in the district, K-12, um, and the TAs are setting those up in the buildings and running those sessions. So that's a lot of testing that's going on with just the MAPS alone. Uh, utilizing E-rate funds. A lot of people don't know that uh, the federal government steps in and, and helps us out with some of the infrastructure for our technology, and I know Ben's going to go over it a little bit in, in uh, the future. But oop, our, uh, I gotta go back. It's not gonna go. um, the E rate is uh, a federal fund that supplies 70% of a project, um, and then the school district only has to pay 30%. So that's a huge savings when it comes to technology related stuff that we can utilize in the federal government. Um, implementing a new HR system. Uh, this is working with the payroll and uh, the treasurer's department, trying to streamline and go with one system instead of multiple systems um, to get HR in, including the uh, employees we currently have in the, the district. Converting instructional staff over to new laptops. Our, our laptops that our staff had were 2017s, really showing their age, starting to die um, when they're trying to give instruction. Um, so we were converting those throughout the year and trying to work with staff and get that done. Our TAs are migrating those over and doing a great job uh, to minimize the impact on the classroom teacher and get those um, moved over as quick as possible. So with that, the, we're about 90% complete with getting those staff members moved over. We're holding off on a few 
few uh, areas because those teachers have requested to hold on to their laptops for instructional purpose for kiddos. So um, we're working with them and trying to get a time frame to get those updated. But you know, we're about 90% complete uh, as we speak. Another big project is Smart Find Express, be going online and helping out payroll department. Um, this is a collaborative effort between uh, Lisa Manos um, and the tech department to get all the staff over on a electronic call off system. Um, I was talking to, to Lisa and she said before she'd have to spend about a day to run payroll for classified, just the classified staff alone in the district. We've cut that to 30 minutes. Wow. That's a huge savings in, in what she needs to be doing. So those are the areas we've got classified done. The administrative staff, secretaries and tech staff are all 100% complete. The custodial and maintenance staff uh, we're working with and we're about 50% of the way through that staff and getting them converted over. Um, some of the big programs. I'm, I'm not going to read down through this whole list. I'll hit the highlights, but this, the tech staff really is involved in a lot of different programs and maintaining um, different programs throughout the, the school. So it goes from the beginning of the year with online enrollment, getting all those kiddos, getting their EMAs, getting them ready for transportation for the bus drivers so it, in the event of there's an accident. Um, ben in charge of uh, the cameras and recording Jamf, which is a deployment system for our devices enabled, it allows us to manage them, see where those devices are. Um, we can locate them at any time. You ask us for an individual student, we can tell you where that device is at at that moment when it pings the inter, uh, um, GPS. A few more. Um, big one I want to hit on going down through there. One, the website, we update that on a daily basis. Uh, securely. A lot of people don't know. We're watching what the kiddos are doing. We can see what they're doing with their iPads. Um, we've had an instance where a kid was searching some self-harm websites. We get notifications. So it's set up that it automatically goes to the building principal, tech assistant in that building, that they're notified of what's going on. So I know we've, we've and then we can contact the appropriate people to intervene. So we are watching what the kids are doing. That includes at home, correct? Yes, correct. that monitoring is happening at home on the school device as well. Okay. Um, some big one, concerto is uh, the TVs that are going on, so we can run daily announcements just so the kids can see it with uh, high school kids coming in. I know it's at the middle school as well. <coughs> Morning video announcements being done um, really helps out. It's on YouTube as well. Edgenuity reaching those uh, kids that have anxiety issues or other medical turn issues that can't, don't allow them to come into the school setting, uh, taking care of those. Sylvia's doing a great job with DDA. <coughs> Um, and then credit recovery those kids that, that way we don't have them fall behind and not graduate. Um, as a group, we attend monthly meetings with network managers, um, gradebook manager, and cybersecurity. So we're going over to the county each month uh, to work with uh, colleagues in the county to go over those following or those groups. Along with in the district, uh, between everybody on the tech team, we're all sitting on at least one of these, if not multiple. Uh, committees in the district, the district leader, leadership team building, and then teacher based. New this year was social media. Um, and I think Nash hit on that. There's sometimes that he'll be on a ride home and they'll post something on Twitter, Instagram. Um, so the, the uh, tech team that, that are sitting on that committee, which there's additional people as well, not just tech, tech people. But uh, they're doing a great job keeping the, the community <coughs> updated on what's going on. Completed project. This is a big one, and I'm going to let Ben take over because this is his uh, his world. So, um, utilizing those E-rate funds uh, that are available to us, one thing that you approved for us to move forward with last year was a project with Lake Tech Communications to implement Aruba Central uh, as a management platform for our network equipment. Uh, what this does is it brings all of our network equipment, our firewall, our switches, our access points, all under what they call one pane of glass management. So we have one place to go to configure, to diagnose um, anything that's going on with the network, as well as it allows us to take advantage of some of the new resources with artificial intelligence to analyze what's going on on our network and to try and find problems that we didn't even know were problems yet. 
Um, and we've been utilizing that quite heavily in the last couple of months. We've run into some issues with our implementation and the AI engine has pinpointed exactly where the problem was um, and told us how to fix it in a lot of cases. So it's been very beneficial and we were able to utilize the E-rate funding to take advantage of that. And uh, some of the big upcoming projects we're working on, uh, we're working on getting rid of about seven different uh, programs to go to one parent communication app. Um, that's a big, big, if, if, big, big thing. We're working. <laughs> and, and not only will it, um, it, it'll streamline it, but it's also making it that it's one stop shop. Nice. So from coaches to parents to, to teachers, that's administrators, it's, it's, uh, it's been a daunting task to get it going, but you know, we're almost there. Um, and then strategic solutions, again, working with, with Mr. Foss and the, uh, the treasurer's office to try to, again, go to one system. They, they moved the, um, all the finances over to strategic solutions, so we want to try to get there as well. So everything talks to each other. That way we're not making redundant uh, entries, um, especially when we're hiring somebody. So it, it's not the painstaking. It's, it's, we've got it kind of narrowed down. Summer duties, so that's coming. Uh, we got to collect all those 1,800 devices back that we handed out in the fall, clean, inspect, <clears throat> inventory, and make sure we've got them, make sure they're in working order. Go around each classroom, uh, make sure all the projectors are functioning. Uh, if there's a TV in there, making it sure it functions. Um, anybody that uh, changes buildings, um, maybe just changing the classroom, making sure the, the phones or uh, network connections are changed to that, that uh, room, um, supporting... Uh, quite a few staff and students in summer school. So we're already starting to earmark those kids um, that are gonna need their devices to, so they don't fall behind. And that's it. Any questions for us? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Okay, so the next item on the agenda before I give my report is just uh, every year we have to give a, just to let you guys at a board meeting, we had to put up the annual report, go ahead, Ben, uh, of compliance with food and beverage standards. So this is just something we do annually. We got to let ODE, ODE know that we do it. Um, it's so you can read that in front of you. It's just basically let us know that Warrington Local Schools has adopted and enforces of the nutrition standards uh, based on Ohio Revised Code. Okay, so this, this does not change. Uh, they just, it, it is a requirement um, from the food service side that we make sure that that is done. Any questions about that? Yeah. Okay. A lot of different reports. April and May are, are two of our probably our busiest months of the year when it you know, comes to getting in closing out to the school year here. So as usual, this is uh, my April report. So I'm Dan Swisher, I'm the superintendent. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and, you know, as, as we'll keep going with, uh, you know, talking about reasons to celebrate, kind of where we're at right now and where we're moving forward. Talking about reasons to celebrate. So it's been about four or five weeks. So last, uh, we did just uh, celebrate last night at uh, the Kent State University Conference Center at Kent Start. Um, our Marlington Local School District, it was countywide, but so every, there's 20 different teachers that were honored last night. Uh, Heather Craig was our honoree this year as the Marlington Local School Teacher of the Year. She is a fifth grade math and science teacher and she's been with us about 14 years. So we had a chance last night to have dinner her family and that came up and uh, she was honored last night we also got a chance to honor our rookie of the year so those are somebody that's been here for less than you know teaching less than three years so our Martin local school district rookie of the year is Alex McDaniel he's a math teacher here at the high school he's also part he also coaches uh, our soccer helps coach uh, with Mr. Calgary so Alex is also a Marlington grad so we are excited to get him back so he's been just a uh, wonderful addition 
here to our high school. So those are just, uh, both those happened last night, so they were excited. It was a very nice evening that we had together uh, last uh, yesterday. Next, we have, uh, it was probably two weeks ago, we had the uh, Ohio, uh, Ohio School Board Association 10-year board recognition. So they had it for veteran board members. So we had a chance to travel up to Wayne County Career Center. We actually, that's where she talked about the in-service that we had. We got to hear Mr. Locke and some other speakers. Uh, we got to have dinner. Uh, so, uh, and then we got to watch Mrs. Uh, Kathy Krupko get honored as a 10-year board member, which is quite an honor. So, uh, you know, Mrs. Humphreys came with us. Mr. Ryan and myself joined that evening. Um, so we got a, I took a quick snapshot of Kathy. I'm not sure she knew I was taking the picture, so. But uh, we do want to congratulate Kathy for 10 years on the board, which is, uh, you know, that dedication and giving to us great. So we appreciate all our board members, but 10 years is great. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Good job. Uh, April 10th, when we came back from spring break, the kids had another day, but we had a professional development day. Um, so typically on those PD days, you know, we design those for uh, data-related purposes within, within the... Uh, confines of their grade level or grade bands or particular subject level. Um, so I kind of, we kind of had a discussion, uh, Mrs. Cayley and myself, Mr. Evanich, about the morning and some things that we need to review. So I just kind of highlighted a few things to review. So on the left, we had Mr. Tyler Smith um, from Stark County Spark. He came in and did cybersecurity. Um, he kind of just reviewed with the staff the importance because from a cybersecurity aspect, it's not banks is not the number one thing that hackers hack, it's education. Okay, that's number one in the world. So if a hacker's looking to continue to hack, it comes education. So that's why we have to be very careful with how we operate within the confines of what we do. So he reviewed that. So it was good for our staff to hear that. Um, and then we kind of switched. So we had half, we had the sixth through 12th staff kind of hear that, while our elementary staff, um, for the first half, they got to, or vice versa, so it was kind of, we did two sessions for an hour. We talked about uh, our crisis plan. Um, so we're gonna be reviewing that a little bit more in June from a board aspect, but our administrative staff and our uh, teaching staff have been kind of updated in the fact that we do have a crisis plan in place. Okay, so that what that means is basically when something would happen in the district at any level, um, we have a very thorough plan. So if somebody would be in an accident, we had somebody that would pass away from a student to a staff member. You know, obviously there are certain protocols that we need to follow, and it's a very in-depth plan based on data, you know, coming in from the professionals above us. So we spent time in, as superintendents for months kind of reviewing that, kind of coming up with what that plan should look like. I'll be honest with you, the plan is probably 86 pages. But we just reviewed what probably the most pertinent parts of that plan, and that's not just Marlington. Every school district in Stark County has that plan. It's just adapted to fit the way the district is. So they kind of got an update. So each, all the teachers on that day. So that was, it was a nice morning. They got to hear a little update from me about where we were at. We sent them to lunch. They got then go back with, to their buildings and kind of do work on the part that's, you know, most meaningful to them, which is the data part. And then obviously some time for themselves to get, you know, prepare for coming back for the kids. Nash did not talk about the High School Musical, I don't think, so I think I got him. He usually got me. catches me. So we, we, we did change our board meeting last month for the musical, so I just wanted to you know, talk about Annie. Our, our kids were just amazing. So if you had a chance to go see the musical on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, and Sunday, I think they ran four days. Four days. They yeah. ran four days. Uh, we had just an excellent turnout. The kids were amazing. Um, I, I can't say enough, but it was, it was, it was definitely worth it worth your time so if you get a chance if you didn't I don't know what next year's musical is going to be but if you get a chance please come out it was just an amazing program so a couple more pictures okay moving on to the now I'm not going to talk about testing Nash beat me to that one so we swapped on that one so we're good so we are in the heat of testing so that's all I'll say uh, I did, we did talk about, we were talking about projects, so this is where we're kind of getting into it. So there was, the, the question came up when we were approving projects, we were talking about, um, you know, what, what it really would cost to abate our, our major buildings, Lexington, for abatement. We do have asbestos probably in every building, but the major building is Lexington. 
So I promised to take a, a look at that on two different kind of fronts there to see what it would take to get that done. So I looked at it, we, we, we kind of got with the environmental support network and Bill Racine came back and kind of said, listen, the size of the abatement that needed to be done, he would, he would recommend in four phases, so four years, four summers. So in general, it's basically anywhere between 120 and $118,000 per session. So if we were to abate Lexington as a whole over the course of four years, you're looking at somewhere in the range of about $520,000 to abate. Either way, no matter what, that would have to be done at some point in time. We were fully aware of this. We knew in the past that we had a rough estimate of 400 some thousand dollars for abatement. So we figured over the course of that, that was probably somewhere in the range of five to seven years ago. I would assume that that rise when you're saying 520,000 is probably just due to the fact it's just sheer inflation. So that's something that I think as a board, we probably we obviously we're not attacking that this summer. We've made, kind of went through what our plans are and we, we're okay right now, but it is something that I want to keep on our radar and have a discussion about it moving forward. We also know that that doesn't complete the project. If you abate anything, it just leaves open spaces. So with Lexington being abated, you just can't have open ceiling spaces. So we had to talk about putting in drop ceiling. You can't just go to Lowe's and buy a drop ceiling. It has to be very specific type of graded drop ceiling you put in. So we did have that estimate come out just, just, just for our purposes of the, get an idea because that was the question. So you're looking at a probably in a range of 130 to $145,000 just to put in a drop ceiling with the correct graded material. Is that per year or overall? That's overall. <clears throat> so total project. <clears throat> total project. So that wouldn't be just per each individual section. That would be the total project. I didn't ask for a breakdown because I couldn't, I didn't cross. I didn't give them and say, <clears throat> hey, if you did this section, you know, in four phases, what each phase would be. You know, we'll cross that bridge if, when we need to, but I, I didn't want to follow up with that. We were looking at what the, you know, kind of a cost was in general right now in today's, today's <coughs> cost, what it would be to abate or put in a drop ceiling right now. Any questions about that? Lexington's just, we're focused on that because that's the, the that's biggest what the, project. That's, that's the biggest project. I mean, in Bill Racine, we said we do have, we have drop ceilings in our other buildings right now. So it's, it's kind of a protection, you know, not that it was an, it, it, intentional or unintentional how it works out you know so as things that we get checked we still would abate them as they come or we have to uh, encapsulate them so if it's a small project so say we notice something a crack or whatever so we do call them in and then we have cardinal come in and they encapsulate so not necessarily everything has to be abated so that we have different options but that was the i mean we had that conversation this year about you know um, what it would cost to do a project that size so I just wanted to kind of bring the, the, the hard figures out tonight where we're at on that. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, I put solar project up here only because um, I, I update the board on, on different things, and this just happened last week. So uh, for those of you that are aware, there's a potential of a solar project that would happen in, in Washington Township, and they did do, uh, I'd say, Within this year, or maybe it was late, maybe it was last year, it's hard to remember, they kind of did a public meeting at Washington Elementary. Uh, so the, they basically, uh, Samsung execs <coughs> and their consultants came back out, reached out to me and said, hey, would you mind if I came in and we gave you kind of an update on the solar project, where they're at, where it's heading, and so forth. So um, we had a meeting with them. Uh, I invited Karen um, in to come into the meeting. Uh, so we sat down with the Samsung execs and their consultants and they just kind of give a quick update so i'm just going to kind of give a very broad scope of that because what that could potentially mean to the district because we always look at what's coming out there in the future uh so as of right now they're they're still basically filling out the application process they kind of have the bulk of the land owners on board where they would feel the project would go they're still looking to expand it a little bit larger so they're still looking with talking to a couple landowners obviously my question was what does that mean because i'm not a solar expert by any stretch they said basically their project is they want to do a 150 megawatt project that's what that's what they call it so the goal is to have a 150 megawatt solar project um, so to make that work though they have to submit to the the Ohio power site board so that's their face so they're about 80 percent ready to get ready to submit to the power the Ohio power site board so they said probably within the next two months 
I would say also within the next two months, they're probably going to do what they call a PIM, which is another public information meeting. So they'll probably reach back out and say, hey, can we use Washington Elementary again to do a, another public information meeting? Because they have a little bit more concrete uh, evidence of exactly where the solar farm would go, how it might affect people or so forth down the line. Um, they basically said once the Ohio Power Site Board approves it, most projects go through. Now there is another layer of approval that has to happen, but that's just their general, you know, 20,000 foot view, so which was fine. So obviously our question was real simple. I mean, how does this affect Marlington local schools? Okay, what does this mean for Marlington local schools uh, is really what we're at because that's the business we're in. Uh, and so they gave us really, it's like two options here. So you, you can, and this isn't going to come down to the board making this recommendation. It's gonna come down to the Stark County commissioners making an approval or not. So there's really, there's, there's two options. At once this project is complete, if the project gets completed, let me tell you, if the project happens and gets approved, if it's a 150 megawatt power project, what, what that means for the district, the township and the county is they, have to, they can either go through what they call a pilot program. So a pilot program is a guaranteed $7,000 per megawatt. So you take 7,000, multiply it times 150, you're talking about a little over a million dollars. And then you got to, then that would get sent to the <coughs> tax commissioner, say Alan Harold would break it down on our millage and basically say how much money would you get. So, you know, you, you could roughly say that would bring into Marlington because obviously Washington Township would, would, would get money out of that. Stark County would get money out of that. Uh, so, you know, we had a rough estimate of maybe between four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars yearly for Marlington local schools. And with doing the pilot, it's a guaranteed thirty to forty years that money. It's not based on depreciation of the project or how much energy brings in. That's option one. The bonus to the pilot, because I brought up the fact that when Nexus came here, they made a statement as in the, the, it's, the valuation of Nexus is $1.2 billion. So the state of Ohio or the education thinks that we have a $1.2 billion home is a, is a layman's way to say it's sitting on our property. So we're obviously losing state funding. As we know, this sits in contentious battle right now, so we're really losing money on two fronts. We're not getting the money that we should get from Nexus, and we're also losing money on the, on the state side, on the foundations. They said the, the benefit of the pilot is that does not affect any valuation at all. It basically, it's like it doesn't exist. So I kind of questioned that. Of course, you know, you're skeptical. I said, I'd like to hear it from Aaron Roush in writing. Aaron Roush is the ODE guru. Guess what? Aaron Roush emails me the next day. It says 100%. I have it in writing. Now, we don't control the pilot. The tax, the, the Stark County commissioners do. So our commissioners have to do it. But there's a bonus. If the commissioners do it, they also get an extra 2,000 per kilowatt. So if you get 9,000, then that goes directly to the Stark County. So there's incentive for that to happen. You know, they said obviously you can go the other route, which would be very similar to Nexus. Basically, you would have an evaluation. It would affect our state foundation money. At the same time, yes, we may receive more money up front from 150 megawatt power, but at the same time, as in any solar grid, it's gonna depreciate over time. So the even out process based on their data is it's worth going to pilot. And that's really a 20,000 foot view in layman's terms. That was the extent of the conversation we had with them because really everything still sits with, they have to submit to the power the Ohio Power Site Board. So outside of that, I just thought that was an interesting conversation. So I think our final question was, if and when this would happen, when would Marlington C possibly see the money, or when would this be built? They said, it, in a perfect world, like everything went through with no issues on the, uh, the permit side and the Power Site Committee, and then it goes to another a group for approval. They said maybe late, 2026, probably 2027, 28. You know, it's probably be more of a realistic thing. So that's still not that far off. That still falls in our five-year forecast range. We can't forecast that, but I mean, it's nice to know. So we'll see how this pans out in the next few months, and hopefully within the next year, we'll have a better idea. But I thought uh, that was worth updating the board and letting you know that they reached out to us. Uh, I had no idea anything about it. That was a uh, 
Samsung that reached out. So if you have any more questions, see me. I do have their cards, so if you want to have any follow-up with that, that's everything I have on that end of it. Questions on that? Did they yeah. mention with the pilot program what period of time that, that amount would be? 30, 40, 30, 40 years. Okay. Guarantee. They said almost everybody that they've done any solar project anywhere in the United States, or at least in, even in Ohio, the pilot program is where the, is where the commissioners have gone. It's, it's, it's almost a no-brainer, but it doesn't guarantee that that's what our commissioners. Again, we can recommend to our commissioners. We can go see them, but that's where it's at. Okay, just a, a side note, I put Career Expo up there. Um, this was a, something that I wanted to happen, uh, and I, it was a conversation, and Mrs. Cayley wanted it to happen. Uh, our Career Tech Group wanted it to happen, so basically we're, 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 we're a little late, which is okay. It's not actually not bad timing. So we have coming up here, um, and hopefully it'll open up. Maybe. Yeah, so May 11th. Uh, we have a career expo, so 11 a.m. to 2, 2, 2 p.m. for students, 3 to 5 p.m. for the community. It's here. It's uh, four companies to come in. gives uh, students and or the community that's looking to enhance their job skills or get a job to come in and talk to these companies <coughs> and uh, possibly move forward. So right now we have 32 companies signed up or businesses coming on May 11th. Wow. So that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, so, and we're going to, we plan on expanding on this next year uh, to do it a little bit earlier and add a few more, uh, I guess, for some of our companies, I would prefer them to speak to our students and kind of give them an idea because we have some companies, I'll use an example, uh, Mac Trailer. You know, you, you hear Mac Trailer, you think welding, so sometimes kids go, I don't want any interest because that's all they do is hire welders. Well, that's not really accurate. If he's got 1,500 employees, I would say at least almost 500 of them are not welders. He has many other job opportunities. <coughs> Same with Morgan Engineering. Same with Scott Robertson's at Robertson's Heating and Cooling. Same with SES. Same with Winkle and many others. So we, we, we kind of want to get to the point of bringing in our, some of our business people to kind of let them know what they could do so that way they're, they feel maybe a little more confident to go to a table and, and, and go out and get some type of experience in that field, which could end up turning into something very lucrative for them down the road. Oh, boy, Ben, hold on. All right. Two more. Wind damage. So we've had two wind storms in the last six weeks. Those have been just fun. Uh, we've had a little bit, little bit of a mess. Our district from, an, from actually electricity held up great. But our pine trees did not in our roofs. So this is out of Washington Elementary. We had a few pine trees go down the first wind storm. Uh, it did affect, uh, it did not get anywhere near a building. It did affect a little bit on the uh, kindergarten playground. It did affect some fencing uh, on the playground in a couple trees out there, as you can see. Um, we were able to get that cleaned up. Uh, that first wind storm, that happened on a Saturday. I think it was Sunday morning. Um, Mrs. Krupko called me bright and early about 8 a.m. It's a... And into I called you Saturday. Saturday. I'm oh, sorry. It's happened Saturday morning. She called me early. She was the first and said, hey, we got some trees down. Um, I think by Sunday at 5 o'clock, we had those trees gone. I, I really want to thank Mike, uh, Mike's tree service, Mr. Castellucci. I mean, he jumped right on it for us, right out there. You, you make a phone call, and he was, he was Johnny on the spot to help us out because we obviously can't have kindergartners <coughs> or cars pulling in on that. End of it. So uh, we also had a little bit of uh, shingle damage on our... Uh, I'm gonna, I call it Sherry's house now. He's called the White House now, <laughs> Sherry's house. That's where we're at. So we call it, uh, but the, uh, our maintenance staff was able to take care of that, Alan Rail. Um, some more pictures of the trees. Now, I, I put the bus garage at Washington because it's a flat roof, but we did, it did pull up. So we are getting that fixed. That's something they can't do. You really can't see that, but it's there. Uh, a little bit. Uh, some, we had some dugouts, some issues there, the dugouts from the wind um, that were getting addressed. Uh, we had the, some of the fencing around the tennis courts also took a beating there. So uh, I just want to give you, so we kind of got estimates on the fencing. We had uh, the Castellucci's took care of some other trees that came down. They submitted, uh, Mr. Foss has reached out to our liability insurance, Darla. Um, so we are, uh, 
looking at. We knew we just found out today kind of where we're at with that. So we'll be able to submit a good portion of this for in our insurance. You picked up on that end of it. Any questions on the wind damage? Uh, finally, I was asked to just to, just to <coughs> give a quick safety update, and I think it's in your guys' folder too. You know, we do a lot of different things for safety. Uh, so we do nine rapid dismissals, or I guess you would call them fire drills per year. You only need to do six if a building has smoke detectors or sprinklers. We do not have smoke detectors or sprinklers. So we do nine. Sometimes the question goes, why do you guys do safety drills all the time? Well, by law, and in there, there's certain uh, reasons we have to follow the drill format based on the age of the buildings, which isn't a big deal. It's just that way it keeps things fresh for the student's mind. Uh, one must be held within during the first 10 days. We obviously do four tornado drills per year, one per month from April to June. We do three functional drills per year. They're conducted with students and law enforcement. Those are what we call pretty much lockdown drills. And we do one theoretical drill per year. Per year, Student participation is optional. As far as I know in our theoreticals, we have not had students participate. We typically do those in PD days. So we're talking about theoretical. And these are state mandates we're talking about. This year we did tabletop exercises with the, with the Sheriff's Department, um, Stark County, Marlboro PD could be that comes in and basically we have, we break our staff into groups and we go through what would happen in this scenario. What do you do? We answer questions. You know, another th theoretical would be actually what we do is a full blown lockdown, what it's like. What does that feel like? What would you do? You know, the, and, and unfortunately some of this is very intense and hard on staff, but at the same time, it's, this is in a real world situation, that's what it's gonna be like. So we do, we do practice those. Um, so I did put in there kind of the, uh, just the state fire marshals require drills for you guys to take a look at. And then, I, and then Mr. Evanich was uh, kindly enough to give us a, uh, a brief update on the tornado drills, fire drills, lockdown, and a little bit of reflection. Since he got uh, bequeathed the safety coordinator when I got moved to superintendent. So he did that. I had him uh, take care of that on that app. Any questions about safety? All right, moving forward, next month. Obviously, it's gonna be next month's a big, big meeting. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about folk scholarships, all right? So we're gonna have, be giving out, the board's gonna be giving out the folk scholarship next month, which we got, I think, 20? Yes. 20 hmm. that we'll be honoring next board meeting, giving out money, so they'll be very excited. Uh, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna, I'll give you a brief update on where I'm heading for staffing and purchase services, because obviously the, that's the five-year forecast meeting. Uh, we're going to talk about recognition of our 20 years of service. Our staff member has been here for 20 years, and obviously we have a retirement celebration. So we're going to do something a little different for our retirees this year. So uh, that'll be next month. So if you have any questions for me as we close out here, move on to the next part of the board meeting. Nope. Okay. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, public participation. Did anyone sign up? No. Okay. Thank you. Old business. <laughs> Before we go into old business, I did have one more item. Uh, you guys did receive a, the board itself and the administration did get a thank you card. Um, so obviously we, we did lose a, uh, a, a beloved staff member, uh, Marion Doyle, one of our custodians, the board did uh, give a uh, beautiful bird bath and floor, flower arrangement. So they put Marlington uh, administration team says, so thank you for the beautiful bird bath, flower, floor arrangement. It was very thoughtful. Marion truly loved the Marlington community. She was blessed to have you all. And that came from her husband, Ron, and then obviously Rhonda, Robin, and Rose. So mm -hmm. they did send that thank you. And I let you guys know, I thank appreciate you. that. Yeah. Okay, old business. Uh, so we have under old business, uh, this will be our second vote. Uh, so this is our normal twice a year. We've, we've met with Neola, so this is the recommend the motion to approve. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. I asked. There was no public participation. Yeah. We just have Bob said no. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. Go on. Okay, back to mm -hmm. Recommend the motion to approve the following resolutions from volume 41. Number two, January 2023, as listed. So moved. Second. Discussion? 
Call the roll, please. Mr. Swift? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Okay, on the new business, uh, the first one is the recommendation, recommendation the, recommend the motion wow, to approve the following resolution as shown in Exhibit A, B. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? This is asking the board to uh, pass the resolution for, this is a mass tort similar to the jewel that you guys did a few years ago and it took the um, there's no cost to the board we're just asking to participate um, this is about social media companies it's very similar to the fact that uh, they just kind of this will give the law form of the France group an opportunity to uh, for Marlington to join in a mass tort claim um, to kind of go at the social media companies that uh, have kind of spearheaded you know maybe the wrong propaganda years ago mm -hmm. to where they're at now call the roll please mr. Hagan yes miss Krupko yes Ms. Humphreys yes mr. Ryan yes mr. Swift yes we have uh, rec second recommend the motion to approve the following out-of-state field trip as shown in exhibit C so moved second, second. Um, discussion. <coughs> this is, oh, it literally is a race. It's the track meet. <laughs> it's a track meet. We're just doing this in advance. If our boys or girls in the Marlington track team happen to make it, they would go to Philadelphia, PA, for the New Balance Outdoor National Meet, which would happen uh, actually in June 14th when school's out. And I, we just were just being cautiously optimistic. Nice. Excellent. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. Next, recommend the motion to approve the student handbook, athletic handbook, and Duke's digital handbook for the 2022-2023 school year, basically, as shown in Exhibit D through F. So moved. Second. Discussion. I can tell you the only change in the handbook was personnel was updated. Okay. Call the roll, please. Mr. Swift? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Um, always a good one here. Recommend the motion to approve the 2023 graduation of the following students listed as shown in exhibit G so moved second discussion call the roll please mr. Hagan yes mr. Swift yes Ms. Humphreys yes Ms. Krupko yes mr. Ryan yes I checked the ash on the list <laughs> you're on the list <laughs> yes that's good news on the list, list. Yes, right. <laughs> next item recommend the motion to approve school fees for the 2023-2024 school year as seen in Exhibit H. So moved. Second. For your information, as you have the school fees in front of you, from last year to this year, there are a few changes. So uh, our K-8 fees are now $35. Last year, they were 30 Okay. Down below that at World Language, Last year it was a total for $17 for French one. Now we have dropped it to French one to $10. And obviously if you're at French two, it's only $10 or French three, it's $10 instead of a, the flat French one for that. If you turn over all the way in the back under, I think last year we had physical education. We no longer are requiring a fee for PE. So we just took it off. That's all the changes. That parking permit, wasn't that 50 bucks at one time? It was at one time, but we did drop that a few years ago to 20. 
and 50 for pay to play is the same as we were before. That, that has been for years. That is the not, same, that's what I thought. That has not changed. I think it's 2008 is when it was implemented. Okay. Are we still offering summer school PE? No. Okay. If they do, it's online. Got it. Through Edgenuity. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. Next is uh, our annual contract with the ESC. Uh, so <laughs> sorry, I recommend the motion to approve the following contract for uh, fiscal year 2024 as seen in Exhibit I. So moved. Second. Apologize, I jumped ahead. This is our annual contract for the ESC. Uh, the difference between last year and this year is $9,034.09 is the difference between last year and this year, more. I don't suppose it was less. It is not. <laughs> Dan, can you highlight some, services. Of the, some of the services we get? Yeah, and in, from and. ESC? Bob can chime in too. So obviously it's a, it's pretty collaborative with the ESC. So obviously we get, we do get preschool services, you know, uh, a portion of that money will go, will goes to preschool, uh, legal. We get legal. Now we obviously use different legal firms based on the scenarios that are placed in front of us, but you know, for a bulk of day to day legal questions, we use uh, the ESC and that's just built into that. So we don't get billed at all for any legal services when we just use the ESC legal. Um, Obviously, part of being in the, the collaboration with them comes with all the, you know, we obviously get billed separately for this, but that's your OT and your PT. I mean, we're not a big district, so we can't hire our own occupational therapist, our own physical therapist, some of our speech and language people. I mean, we're still paying in addition on top of this fee for it, but we won't have to go out and search for it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, then when it comes to collaboration with the tech side, the spark, you know, and that, so they, they come to monthly meetings. Our superintendents have monthly meetings. Renee goes to curriculum, they have a curriculum monthly meeting. They have an instructional leaders monthly meeting. Uh, they have title meetings. They have uh, all the different teachers that we send to for lead teacher meetings is all part of the collaboration in that. Trainings, technical assistance. Um, I'm going to training tomorrow. You know, finances, it's, 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 quite an amazing deal when you really put it in perspective if you really had to farm out even just you know we take for granted picking up the phone and calling somebody what that might cost right. you know to, and uh, the answers you get so it's um, nice. that's good thanks yep. okay. thank you okay call the roll please <clears throat> mr ryan yes Ms. krepko yes mr hagan yes Ms. humphreys yes mr swift yes uh, number seven, I uh, recommend the, the motion to approve the following resolution with uh, LJ Masonry for the brick remediation work at Marlboro Elementary as shown in Exhibit J. Motion. So moved. Second. Okay, the reason why this, this, uh, this was not put on last month was we uh, talked about what it would cost or do. This is the Jim Wall at Marlboro. Um, we wanted to get that kind of taken care of. We talked about possibly would it be better just to cover it with, um, like, I guess I don't want to say siding because that's the inappropriate word. It's a very layman's way to put it. We want to kind of get an estimate out there. So basically what, what we got back was to put on vertical metal wall panels, new coping metal and metal hat, uh, hat channels was basically a hundred to $125,000. They also said, just on a side note, all masonry work, including the removal and replacement of the lentils, must be completed prior to installation of the system. So you still have to pay a portion of what we were going to do anyway. So it just kind of gave us feedback. They gave us an idea. Okay. So I think we're in, a, we're in pretty good shape with the quotes we got, and I didn't want to let that one pass. That was the only one we held on. But we did agree as a board we were going to move forward with it. So I wanted to put that on there after I got that. I felt that that's a prudent move that we were doing this way. Good. Okay. This is primarily for the <coughs> west side of the building, right? Yes. Gym west. Jim. Yes, Jim Wall. Jim yep. Wall. Now, I got a question. On the original quote, they had the additional repair of the upper north corner of the west wall. Are we moving forward with That's that? That's in too? there. That's in with this. 
that's in there? Yeah, it's just part of her overall budgetary process that's going to be done. Okay. Yeah, I did ask and call her ask about that. Okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Ryan? Yes. Okay, the next one's not a recommend, it's not a motion to recommend, but it is, we talked about it, you heard them talk about E-rate, so I just, if I wanted to give you an idea, if you have any questions for, uh, for Ben about any, you know, if you want to give anything on the E-rate update for this year. As Eric said, E-rate for Marlington funds our, uh, our connectivity at about a 70% level. Um, and there's two, two different portions of that funding, a Category 1 and a Category 2. Um, the way I look at it is Category 1 funding brings the connectivity into the building. Um, and the spark contract that you have in front of you there for internet service is that category one service. Um, so that gets connectivity to the building. And then category two is a budget that is made available to us for funding internal connections. So distributing that internet connectivity throughout the building. Um, in the past, we've utilized that funding for um, Installing new switching equipment, new access points. That was a huge prog program that we just went through uh, back in 2020. Um, the Aruba Central setup that we went through this year was funded under a Category 2 funding. And the quote you have there from Lake Tech um, for some additional access points is also a Category 2 item. Um, what those are for this year is some additional access points just to fill in some holes that we've identified. As I said, the AI was identifying problems that we didn't even know we had in some areas of the buildings. So we've added some access points there to fill in some holes. Um, and just to keep moving forward to the uh, category two budget is on a five year cycle. So fiscal year 21 through 25 is where we're at right now. So we're kind of in the middle of that, just doing some little things, um, but we'll be identifying here if we need to do any major projects in the next two years before that cycle uh, renews again. Okay. So any questions? Thank you, thanks. Okay, a few more here in new business. Uh, recommend the motion to approve the following foreign exchange students. <coughs> I, I'm not going to butcher their names there. Uh, for the 2023-2024 <laughs> school years, you can so see those moved. exhibit M. So right. moved. I vote that Dan says their names. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fair. Uh, call the roll, please. Mr. Swift? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krepko? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Okay, next, the recommend the motion to approve the Stark County Health Department contract as shown in Exhibit N, and the annual also uh, for that. So you want to compare last apples to apples. So we look from last year to this year. Uh, Generally, we were basically at a $40 per hour rate for a nurse. They moved it to 43 an hour. So what's that come out to for us? Last year, we were charged for nursing services as a whole for a year, $54,600. This year's contract will be $58,695. So that we we're basically a difference of an additional this year be $4,095. We do have two nurses, but it's equivalent to one. So we have two part-time nurses that make one full-time nurse. So we can pay for one. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Call the roll, please. <clears throat> Mr. Hagan? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. Before we move on to the treasurer's agenda, I'd like to add a, I'd like to add one more motion if that's allowed based on votes. 
I would, you know, yeah. would like to bring up the motion. And I, we didn't do this addition correction because I did not want Bill Coe to know we were naming the field after him. Right. Um, so I did speak with you about this. Mm -hmm. So I would like to recommend the motion to name the Marlington softball field the Bill Oh, healed. So right second. behind you, right second. behind us. Hey, just sure as a matter of procedure, would you mind uh, the first uh, motion be to add that to the agenda? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. Amend the agenda, and then we'll have the resolution. Can, can I make a motion to amend the agenda to add yes. a to add something new business? So moved. Second. Okay. Call the roll on that. Mr. Ryan. Yes. Mr. Hagen. Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krepko? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. Okay, next then I would like to make a motion to name Marlington's softball field to be renamed Bill Co. Field. So, so moved. moved. Second. <laughs> Five of us motioned out. <laughs> yeah. okay, take my pick, I guess. Yeah, anybody, just who you want. All right. Okay, and call the roll. Ms. Krepko? Yes. Mr. Hagen? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. Thank you. Treasurer's agenda. Mm -hmm. You're on, moment. Okay, I hope the video was working. That'll help me sort that out for minutes. So. <laughs> All right, uh, first recommendation from the treasurer is that uh, the Board of Education approve the minutes from the March 15th regular board meeting. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the roll, please. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Hagen? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krepko? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. I would like to recommend that the Marlington Local Board of Education approve the financial reports for the period ending March 31st, 2023. So moved. Second. Discussion? Is there, are there any highlights you have? Um, no, not from the reports per se. I do have a couple of things just to update you on as far as what's been going on. But from the financial reports, um, no, other than to say, I guess one thing is more procedural with the department, uh, with the office, was just that the reconciliation went a little bit better this month. Yeah. So um, I was pleased about that. You know, we're trying to do some things to try to make make the process cleaner, not miss things, and just be more careful, find more ways to have cross checks. Um, I think I mentioned it in prior meetings, but the way the health insurance works was problematic. Uh, I compliment Lisa Manos in particular. She's come up with a lot of ways to make sure that, that those amounts get to the GL um, more accurately or less likely to have problems. Um, so. The team's doing a real good job, but we are looking for ways to um, improve efficiency. Eric Siders, what he mentioned about like um, strategic solutions and looking to um, do some HR onboarding and use their software in-house. Uh, he, I don't think he mentioned it, but the big, the big takeaway for our office is going to be not just efficiency, <coughs> but just kind of the natural better processes that come from getting rid of paper. There is a lot that we do that's paper and um, just not the quickest way to handle things. It hurts the payroll process especially. And now HR is so integrated into payroll, um, it has a cer certain problems that will be remedied by this once we get it on board. So looking forward to do that. Great. Bob, can I? Ask a question real quick. Why, why are there two separate data sets with two, two totals? For the uh, disbursement summary report? Yeah. That's, that's a heading thing that needs to change. The first report you see, um, I think it's probably the fourth, third or fourth column over. It'll say reconciled. Um, 
-hmm. date. You, you see that the ones that aren't there. reconciled then are the second set. Yeah, so the first, the first set, it's, okay. it's really kind of like a different filter on the same report. Gotcha. The first one shows all the checks that cleared for the month. The second one are those that are outstanding currently. Okay. They said outstanding. On that second set, they need to update the start date too, just 1-1-2000. It should be three oh. one twenty three, I think. Um, no, because it's really picking up oh, any that are outstanding that, oh, really? history. It's, okay. It's kind of like as far back as we can go. So. Okay. Yeah. Which is yeah. actually that's even a little bit of progress there too. I know uh, I mentioned Lisa Manos doing a great job. Um, that was one thing she did not so long ago too was to clean up some of the ones that were hanging out there forever and a day. You know. Um, track down people. Why wasn't you know? Do you, do you still have the check? Why didn't you uh, deposit it? Reissued a couple uh, to replace lost ones. Clean audit report too. Good. That's um, yeah. The other two kind of updates. Um, <laughs> that's probably a, a more important one. Is the audit report is completed. Um, so that is available on the Outer States website publicly. I considered printing off copies for you, but since it's over 90 pages long, um, I thought, I'll just let you know it's on the Outer States website. If anyone needs a copy, it, there is one available in my office, and uh, we can make that copy of those for so, you. So you guys just started recently doing this where it was separate? Because I, I remember them all being intermixed, you know, the reconciled and... Oh, you know what? I. I don't know what we did before I came. Um, um, I'm just saying on previous yeah. reports, I could have swore I remember seeing some yeah. that were, you know, I don't remember there being two sets, but yeah, it just and, be me. And, Does it and frankly, if you no, got... I was just wondering if yeah. it was something we changed. If you'd like to see it different, too, let me know, because, I mean, there's a couple ways to do this, too. It could be just like okay. all checks and then show their status, one report. Um, I know oh. we use that outstanding number for our... our uh, Cash reconciliation oh, I like month like too, so that's why seems probably why it, she yeah. gravitated towards that. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, we got to do what's workable for you and your office. Yeah. Thank you, but well, appreciate let's, that. Let's vote on this, right? <laughs> I, I'm good with that. Okay. All or all. Mr. Ryan. Yes. Mr. Hagen. Yes. Ms. Humphreys. Yes. Ms. Krupko. Yes. Mr. Swift. Yes. The next item is to also, um, or is to recommend the board approve the donations. So moved. Second. Okay. okay. I will read those momentarily. Okay. I can read it for you if you want. Thank you, Dan. You have a uh, anonymous donor to Washington Elementary for the amount of $150. You have uh, picks bricks to Washington Elementary in uh, $100. Both these are for raffle prizes and donations for the STEAM Lab. We have Plus Plus to Washington Elementary for raffle prizes and donation for the STEAM Lab. That was $175. And Southwest Ohio Instructional Technology Association for $150 uh, to Washington Elementary. This is also for raffle prizes and donation for the STEAM Lab. I wasn't going to try to say it. Let's appreciate those donations for sure. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Swift. Yes. Mr. Hagen. Yes. Ms. Humphreys. Yes. Ms. Krupko. Yes. Mr. Ryan. Yes. The next item is to approve uh, or to recommend the board approve the revenue and budget revisions as pre presented in the exhibit. So moved. Second. Discussion. Um, one one note about that I wanted to share too is uh, you'll you notice on there the food service fund cafeteria 006, uh, fairly significant increase. Um, built into that is basically you know think of inflation how that's affected us. Uh, there essentially wasn't quite enough budgeted for food supplies for the year. So that amount that you see there is based on 
uh, an estimate of $47,000 needed per month for April and May. And then as things taper off, another 15000 for June. And I also have $30,000 in there for a new uh, combi oven, they call it, mm -hmm. um, that has essentially died and needs uh, more repairs than it's worth. So, it, it, Just so you know, we said that we have our, our, foods, our food is uh, $600,000 ahead. So we're just moving money. So we only budgeted, you know, the previous treasurer budgeted for the year. This is our shortfall, but we're not really just taking money out of that food service fund and putting it into this, did our budget for the year. So this is not coming, this isn't really affecting yeah. the general fund by any stretch. Yeah, it doesn't affect the forecast, and that's a very pertinent point to Dan. It's just that there's plenty of money right now in our cafeteria fund, which is really a blessing. There are districts out there that have to um, help support their cafeteria from the general fund. So it's being run well. All right. Call the roll, please. Mr. Swift? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Um, I, just one uh, point, too. Uh, we might want to handle it first thing, but um, as we get into personnel, that addition that we had to add Jan Luke as a sub at the beginning, I think the way we handled that was that vote was really to add that to the agenda, but we didn't get that onto those following Thanks. pages. So if um, maybe as the first personnel item, if uh, you all wouldn't mind um, taking a roll call on that, a motion, second roll call to do that item number five, adding Jan Luke as a uh, sub. That would uh, probably so do be good for my record. motion and a second? To do that? Yes. So, so like what we did was to add it to the agenda. Second. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So Kathy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Call the roll. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. Hey, Bob, one more thing before you end this. Uh, I'd like to set up after the meeting tonight, set up a meeting for Finance Committee to go over the five-year budget so we can get together. Perfect. That was the one update I, I didn't get to, and I kind of missed me there. <laughs> I'll give it to you now briefly. Um, was that um, I met twice with... Um, Ryan from uh, Frontline and to work on the forecast the most recently was this morning um, to go over that and start start the work on that and so that is we're in that process of, as you all probably know it's due to the state by May 31st so it will need to be addressed it'll be on the agenda at the next board meeting so my intention is to meet with Mr. Swisher late this week, hopefully, and then I would uh, approximately a week from now or next week sometime, I'd hope to be ready that we can meet with the Finance Committee Perfect. to review that as well, too. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, on to personnel. Um, I would, if you guys are good, I would, I'm gonna consent the personnel. Yes. Kind of give an update as I go through. All right, so we do have a classified uh, resignation. We have two, just so you know. So we have Mrs. Lepley and Mrs. Neiman. So we both our secretaries at Marlboro have resigned, uh, effective at the end of the school year. We have some certified staff hires. Uh, so we have one, and that's just uh, she, uh, Mara Knox becoming an intervention specialist. That is not a new position. She's Mara's been working for us all year. She's been as a sub. She just got her licensure. We're able to make her a teacher, which is where she, is where she would have been. Uh, classified sub hires or staff hires there. We just got Tasha Kostoff, that's the athletic secretary. That's not a new hire. She's replacing Mackenzie Showalter. Um, we have Kristen Dixon as a recess monitor. She's actually replacing Lindsay Sickles. Lindsay Sickles is going to become a para pro because she's replacing Jill Ginther because Jill Ginther left and became an FSS. So all of those are just basically movements within the system. 
We have our supplemental list there for you. you can take a look. We target those. I'm trying to get those done as early as possible. So that most of those wrapped up by next board meeting. Uh, we also have our typical migrant hires for the summer. You'll see the list there attached. If you want to take a look at the migrant hires for the summer. We have a few student summer hires. This will probably continue in the next month. You know, we always try to employ a few of our students to help out support through the summer. STEAM camp. We have STEAM camp, obviously, the first week after school. Uh, we have hires for that. That's completely funded through the STEAM camp itself, you know, as they pay their registration fees for camp. We have a non-traditional sub hire, okay? We have a summer custodian hire, uh, one. And we have a classified staff transfer. We just have a cook going from a three hour to four hour. We have a, we had a three hour, four hour cook uh, resign. Um, we have not replaced that. So this is an internal going from a three to a four. And then we're gonna set, we are looking to currently replace then the three hour at some point in time when that happens. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. And just so you know, back to the Jan Luke, she would fall under a classified or she would fall under a certified staff hire as a sub. Just so you know, she's a sub. Any discussion? Call the roll, please. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krupko? Yes. Mr. Swift? Yes. Finally, announcements. I've kind of uh, asked the administrative team to kind of get some hit some big targets here coming up because May is busy. End of April, May is busy. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of what's coming up. I'm not going to read through those. This is more for the board to kind of, you know, kind of get their calendars in order of things that they choose to, uh, to attend on their availability. So obviously there's a lot going on. I know you can't make everything, but, you know, those that you can make, I appreciate if you guys, you know, I really appreciate you coming out. You guys have done a great job of that this year. So please, thank you. Thanks. Okay, hey, is there a motion to, oh, I'm sorry, the next board meeting will be May 18th at 6 p.m. here in the high school DLZ. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the roll, please. Mr. Swift? Yes. Mr. Hagan? Yes. Ms. Humphreys? Yes. Ms. Krepko? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Thank you for attending. <laughs>